we're going to see the foreigners actually taking money out at the same time. What's that going to do to the yield curve? It's going to drive it sharply, sharply higher because you Americans, for the first time in an awful long time, are going to have to be funding your own government deficit. Yeah. Now, and not only that, but you'll have to absorb the stock that the foreigners are selling. So you can see that there is a potential here, which is going to be extremely unpleasant for the for both the dollar and also interest rates. Um, now this tells me one thing: you're going to get QE. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. With surprising new concerns expressed about Dunnigan's changing hairstyle, one viewer even commented that hair is dyed, fried, and laid to the side. But what you're not being told is Dunnigan's hair needs no dye thanks to the wonderful vitamin and mineral regimen that Melody recommends, and is not laid to the side to cover any bald spot either since Dunnigan's full head of hair is exceptionally well attached. However, Dunnigan does use hair products only as a disaster prevention because he's at severe risk of catastrophic emergency situations. But although there may be some changes you don't like to hair, this is one kind of change you'll definitely want to have on hand if the situation gets hairy. Pure silver! And for a limited time, your first ounce of silver can be purchased at spot price with free shipping on orders over $99 by going to sdbullion.com slash rp and you'll be supporting reluctant preppers as well it's within your grasp to get your hands on the perfect change for hairy situations at sdbullion.com slash rp p.s don again was not harmed in the making of this video as a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it we ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's always a privilege to have this returning guest. Alistair McLeod is the head of research at GoldMoney.com. Alistair joins us from the UK where he's researching things such as the Brexit or not, the... Uh, Eurozone health and the health of the euro itself, overall global economy, and what's different about the way that China and Russia are backing their currency in preparation for a credit crisis. Alistair, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. That's my pleasure, Donegan. I hope it's not uh, too cliche that I always ask you first to update us from the UK perspective of the Brexit, because uh, this has been a phenomenon which has been of high interest to people in the U.S. as well, following the populist uprising of the Trump uh, tidal wave and that sort of thing, and, and other uh, populist leaders and nationalist leaders around the world. We were kind of cheering in our own little way here from our side of the pond after after we had uh, thrown off the oppression of the British Empire 200 years ago that you guys were going to finally throw off the oppression of the Eurozone, and uh, it's been a bit of a soap opera drama of uh, Brexit or not. Can you bring us up to date on what are the major factors you see driving the, this uh, controversy? Well, the major factor basically is that the establishment doesn't want uh, to split up the, um, uh, the European Union. And um, what we have seen is precisely that. I mean, Mrs. May, quite clearly, uh, is a Remainer. And uh, it's for her, it's been a damage limitation job, if you like. Brexit in name only. Um, in terms of negotiations, I mean, it hasn't been a negotiation at all. It's 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 uh, really been quite appalling. So, what we have is we have a, a government which has completely failed um, in any attempt to deliver the electoral mandate of the referendum in 2016. Um, and uh, Mrs. May first said that she didn't want to extend the date beyond the 29th of March. Um, and then she said that she didn't want to extend it but beyond uh, this coming Friday, which is um, 12th, 12th of uh, April. And now it seems that she's managed to persuade them in Brussels to give us up until October. <laughs> now, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work because um, there are real problems, I think, for the EU in this. Uh, they will be returning UK members of the European Parliament, because those elections are coming up in, I think it's May the 23rd. Um, the, uh, you know, the procedure needs to start rolling actually round about um, next week uh, for that. Uh, you know, like people register in order to um, stand for election and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. So um, it looks to me as if this is definitely going to go ahead. Now, Nigel Farage uh, has set up a new 
um, entity, the Brexit Party, um, <laughs> and he's determined to go in there and cause as much trouble as possible. Um, and good luck to him. <laughs> um, the Conservative Party, who have, they're faced with local elections, um, and that's on May the 2nd. Um, their ratings have plummeted down to rock bottom, as you may imagine. Uh, according to the polls, if there was a general election tomorrow, uh, the Labour Party would garner 42%. The Tories would garner something like 30 odd percent. So um, madly, wildly communist um, Marxist um, Jeremy Corbyn is, is actually more popular than um, a so-called sort of centralist um, in, in, you know, Prime Minister and the Conservative Party. It's really a pretty awful state of affairs. Um, I think that uh, the way in which this is being played by the Remainers is the longer they can delay Brexit, the less chance Brexit will actually take place. So really, in summary, what we have is the establishment uh, is completely divorced from the electorate. The establishment has got its own objectives. And... Um, the electorate can go to go to hell and damnation. I mean, what what do they know? What do they got to do with it? You know, they just should shut up. That's our democracy. That is the state of our democracy. That theme you just described of the elite being disconnected from the good of the people is not unique to Britain. It sounds like the, more of the same uh, that we've seen uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, what is your view of the overall eurozone uh, health and the health of the euro uh, currency specifically? Well, it's pretty, it's pretty dire. I mean, we, we've, we, the Italian economy is um, really in pretty bad shape. Um, I think we need to draw a distinction between a time when economies are generally stable to growing, which has been the situation um, really since the Lehman crisis. You know, after the initial recovery, things have sort of basically got together and, um, you know, it's been a background against which uh, crisis management tends to work. You know, you could deal with the Greeks because the whole world wasn't going to hell in a handbasket. Now we have a very different situation because um, it is clear to me that the credit cycle has turned and I think we're getting uh, increasing numbers of um, influential commentators beginning to accept that that is probably the case. So if we're heading to a period where um, we're no longer growing, the global economy is no longer growing and we're hitting, a, if you like, a period of contraction, a potential credit crisis and all the rest of it, then it's a very different situation in terms of the ECB and the EU managing their way out of the problems that occur. So we look at the Italian economy in that context. We look at the banking system, like Deutsche Bank and Commerce mm -hmm. Bank. I mean, these are the principal banks in the most healthy part of the Eurozone. And you look at the share prices and you think, these guys are in trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, we know they're in trouble. And in fact, uh, if you look at um, uh, banks like that, they've done away with um, uh, their investment banking operations, or rather, if not actually closed them down, they've reduced them to virtually nothing. They're now left with uh, branch networks, which are absolutely enormous and very, very costly. There are people like Gold Money who offer alternatives, um, you know, purely electronic. I mean, we can handle accounts at zero additional cost <laughs> for Deutsche Bank hmm. in um, Wuppertal or wherever the branch is. You know, they have got huge, great expenses. Uh, and uh, so they're not fit for purpose, if you like, in this modern world. That is a sort of real, real problem. And on top of that, they've got the legacy of all the misbehavior um, that they did in the past, which was uncovered, if you like, by the last um, uh, credit crisis. Um, and uh, you've still got regulators chasing them. Basically, um, these banks for, say, the American regulators are a source of funds. <laughs> you know, you, you uh, find that they've been fiddling with LIBOR or something like that, bring a case against them and uh, you find them a billion dollars. You know, it's a source of income. So, you know, banks... Euro, the Eurozone banks are very much yesterday's story. And uh, I, see, I just see if there is going to be a banking crisis on the next credit uh, contraction um, or tendency towards credit contraction, I think it is really going to be in the Eurozone. So that's interesting because we were talking with John Adams, an economist down from Australia, and he also sees uh, 
unprecedented changes there in the debt posture, not only of the of the government but of the yeah. of the average household, and and he sees uh, real estate values rolling over, and this we've also seen in the U.S. And so I guess if we could broaden the discussion out uh, to, yeah. to the global economy. Um, what you talked about, the ECB having recently just announced that they're going to hold, not make any changes to their, which is, you know, unprecedented, <laughs> historically low uh, negative, negative, negative rates. interest rate policies. Yeah. And the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve also having just recently announced that they're that they're going to have a posture towards potentially easing and, and stopping unwinding their balance sheet and all these things. So it, all, as you mentioned, and we've also, as you mentioned, there's also been some pretty high profile um owners of or spokespeople for large brokerage houses we've even come out and publicly admitted that it looks like there's there's rough times ahead but at, in the face of that uh if i guess if you could contrast what's the reality of the global economy versus and the and the, this global credit cycle that you're talking about versus the fact that like for example flagship u.s dow jones stock index continuing to to you know, be pushed towards uh, potentially all-time highs and people thinking, wow, it looks like the next leg is up and so on. Can you kind of contrast what's the reality of the global economy as you see it uh, versus uh, some of these leading indicators? Well, the reality as I see it is um, uh, you have got a combination of the peak of the credit cycle and we're beginning to go down the other side, coinciding with trade protectionism. Now, the reason this is important is that um, there is a precedent for this, and that precedent was October 1929. On the 30th of October 1929, Congress passed the provisions of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. In the month of October 1929, the market fell from high to low by 35%. It then subsequently recovered and consolidated. Now, I think we're beyond that point. We saw the market crack off a few months back, I think sort of uh, in the last quarter of 2018. Mm -hmm. And we've recovered since. Um, this is exactly the pattern we had in, in 1929. Um, and I think the recovery was around about six months, something like that. After that, um, because there had been signs that the the, 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 the uh, American economy, the global economy, was slowing, and it was slowing more sharply than anyone thought. Initial reaction, reduce interest rates, make money available. In those days, it was uh, very much on the fiscal side. You know, they would chuck money at farmers. They would try and underwrite prices so that they wouldn't fall and all the rest of it. We do it slightly differently nowadays, but the underlying problem is exactly the same. It's the coincidence of tariffs, killing international trade, and the end of the credit cycle moving into the crisis phase, if you like, that always ends uh, every credit cycle. And um, I hope this is wrong because, as we know, 1929, um, the market fell uh, from peak to a bottom in 1932 by roughly 90%, I think it was 89% to be precise. Um, if we've got that ahead of us, uh, that you know, something on that scale ahead of us, then uh, that gives us another problem which they didn't really have to this extent in the 1930s, and that is the government welfare commitments are uh, enormous, and it's mandated. By law, governments have to uh, provide welfare, whether it's health care, unemployment benefit, whatever, whatever in a way in which they didn't have to do in the 1930s. The reason we have it is because of what happened in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So um, when you get a crisis of this sort, government finances deteriorate extremely rapidly. Not only do you find that the tax income starts dropping off rapidly, but also welfare commitments start rising rapidly so that instead of having... Um, a budget deficit in America, which is sort of knocking on a trillion dollars, we're probably going to be looking at something like two to three to four trillion dollars building up, if you like, um, over the next two or three years. So the question is, how is this going to be financed? At the moment, foreigners have been financing uh, the uh, budget deficit um, through recycling the proceeds from the trade deficit. Now what's happened is that we've seen the last two tick figures coming out of um, uh, the U.S. Treasury have shown that uh, foreigners have uh, been net sellers of dollars and dollar assets to the tune of $257 billion in December and January alone. 
And if you look slightly closer at the figures, you'd be impressed by the speculative build-up ahead of that. Obviously, money was coming in because the dollar was rising. Now, that to me is speculative. Um, if you looked at what governments were doing, um, you know, like sort of sovereign players in the U.S. Treasury market and, and uh, with uh, banked dollar deposits in the banks, they've actually been reducing their position for the last 10 months. Mm -hmm. And they have sold off around about a net 240 odd billion. What this tells me is that not only are we going to see a rapid expansion in uh, the funding requirements uh, of the US government and incidentally governments in other um, uh, countries, uh, particularly in the Eurozone, but um, we're going to see the foreigners actually taking money out at the same time. What's that going to do to the yield curve? It's going to drive it sharply, sharply higher. Because you Americans, for the first time in an awful long time, are going to have to be funding your own government deficit. Yeah. Now, and not only that, but you'll have to absorb the stock that the foreigners are selling. So you can see that there is a potential here, which is going to be extremely unpleasant for the for both the dollar and also interest rates. Um, now this tells me one thing: you're going to get QE. There is no other solution to this. Um, well, there is a solution: basically, deal with the bloody problem. But what the Fed will do, quite simply, they believe in QE. They believe in chucking money at any problem that comes along. They know the government is in trouble. They don't want to have Mr. Trump shouting down their necks. They want to give him the money he needs in order to, um, you know, appear a responsible president. So uh, to me, it's a no brainer. You're going to get QE big time, big time. So we're going to get it in the Eurozone. Um, so we're entering a completely new phase, which um, I, has one major difference from that 1929 to 32 episode when you had Smoot Hawley and the credit cycle, which had been expanding throughout the 1920s, suddenly coming to a halt in 1929. And that big difference is the quality of the money. In those days, currencies were gold backed. If you didn't like the dollar, you could go and redeem it for gold at uh, 20.67 dollars to the ounce. You could do the same with sterling, you could do the same with virtually every other major currency. So, you know, in, in those days, your prices, which were falling very rapidly, and this was, it was this deflation, as they ended up calling it, which actually was, was, was falling prices, not deflation. Deflation is a contraction of money. Um, money was expanding, basically, because um, Hoover and then uh, Roosevelt were spending it, my God, they were spending it to try and sort of stop all this happening. Mm -hmm. What it meant was that um, prices were reflecting what was the purchasing power of gold in those circumstances, not the dollar. And that is why, um, uh, first of all, in 1933, you had the executive order which basically banned Americans from owning gold. And then that was followed up by a massive devaluation in January 1934, when you went from 20.67 uh, to the ounce to 35. Nowadays, it's very different. We have a dollar, euro, all major currencies, no backing whatsoever. They're pure fiat. So what happens? Well, you've got the central banks whose mantra is never, ever let prices fall. Always ensure they rise at a target of 2%, but never let them fall. Mm -hmm. So we can see what's going to happen. They're going to err on the side of printing money, flooding the market with money to ensure that prices don't fall. Now, that eventually, after a period of time, and it may not be a very long period of time, will lead to a complete collapse of the purchasing power of these major currencies. There is a uh, one difference, and I'm, I've written about it in an article which will be published later today. If you look at uh, Russia and China, they are yeah. actually insulated from this. They have insulated their banking systems from the West. Um, Russia in particular has done this. China has built up, um, I, she dominates the physical bullion market. She, um, she is the, by far the largest player her people have bought something like 17,000 tons since 2002 of physical gold, which they now have in their possession. The Chinese government, which has been adding to its reserves month on month, you know, I mean, those figures are absolute peanuts. They have got a lot more gold in storage in the background. 
I think that the reason they're adding to it basically is that the people which they are in partnership in this, the Russians, have been adding to theirs. The Russians basically have been trying to just get ship the dollars out in return for bullion. Remember that the Moscow Gold Exchange, it, well, it's the wider exchange, the Moscow Exchange, through which gold dealings are handled, and also Shanghai are now linked up. So I think that the central banks, the Central Bank of Russia and the People's Bank in China are working together now. Um, that, to me, is the evidence of the situation. On top of that, um, I've just mentioned that China has encouraged people to um, buy physical gold. In fact, at one stage, they were advertising to their people, you know, television adverts, go out and buy gold. Uh, this was uh, going back to, um, I suppose, 2011, 12, 13, round about that time. That's what they were doing. The story now is that Russia will remove VAT from bullion or the personal um, uh, purchase of gold, um, uh, which is there's a VAT of 20 percent. Now, um, you know, we look at that in the West and say, well, OK, this is um, sounds reasonable. Um, it's likely to increase a bit of demand. I mean, 50 to 100 tons has been mentioned in one article I saw. But people are missing the point. Um, if you remove the taxes from the purchase of physical gold in Russia, what you're doing is you're enabling the people to build up their own personal gold reserves and for that to act as money at a future date. And that, I think, quite simply, is actually what they're trying to do. So we have a situation where the West is going to kill itself because of the problems it has created by uh, allowing itself to print money unfettered since 1971, which is when they tried, the, you know, the American government tried to persuade us all that gold was yesterday's story. Nothing to do with the future. The future is the dollar. Forget gold. It's a pet rock and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, from that time, they have begun to undermine uh, their own currencies. And not only that, but undermine them to the point where they will eventually be destroyed. And I think that if we get the sort of downturn that I've just described from that combination of uh, tariffs, trade protectionism, plus the turning of the credit cycle, and it's, it's half as bad as uh, 1929 to 1932, then I think it also means the end of the Western fiat currency system. This is the we're approaching it sounds like the climax of something that's been in in the building for some time and a lot of our guests have have talked about some of these uh same mega trends that you've been describing but you you're pointing out very pointedly uh that the we have these alignment of the peak of the credit cycle with the tariffs with the uh accumulation of uh, protection on the part of those countries that don't want to participate in this fallout in the face of all of those huge factors What's an ordinary person to do to protect themselves as best they can so they don't end up uh, looking like those photos we've all seen of the people standing in the soup lines at, in, the, in the Great Depression and uh, just wretched and, and miserable when this thing fall, falls apart? I'll be very rude and answer the question with a question. Uh, if, if suddenly uh, fiat currency is no longer useful to you because it has been destroyed, what do you use as money? If you ask anyone that, I mean, you'll get apart from the don't knows, which, which you're bound to have. And a few people say, well, perhaps Bitcoin or something. Um, I think you'll find around the world there is one common answer, and that is metallic money, gold and silver. That is what will be used as money in those circumstances. And I would I, I don't give investment advice. Um, and I think talking about strictly money probably isn't in that context, legally, investment advice. But I would have thought that anyone who goes into this brave new world with no physical gold under their belt is um, undertaking enormous financial risks and even survival risks. I mean, you must have, you must have some gold or silver, I mean, particularly gold, um, because if it does, if I'm right, and it does become the backing for uh, the ruble and for the uh, Chinese uh, renminbi, then um, without gold, you're sunk. You know, do you want to sink with your own government? So that's the basic question. You know, what are you going to use for money if we destroy, if we end up seeing our own government state-issued currencies destroyed? 
I think the answer is quite simple. Alistair, you mentioned that you're going to be writing an article about this, and by the time this is published that people can probably find that article. What title should they search if they want to find that? Um, I'm trying to remember what I, what I called it. Um, Golden Straws in the Wind I call, I, uh, is, is what I titled, the title I gave it. Um, mm. And I can, Golden Straws in the Wind. I mean, straw, you know, you get straws in the wind, evidence there's something happening, if you like. These are golden straws in the wind. And I concluded that round the corner there's a damn great haystack of golden straws. So um, look out for that. It'll be published on goldmoney, uh, dot, uh, com, and um, it's, it'll be under the heading of uh, research, second heading, insights. The, the insight articles are the ones I write weekly and are published on Thursdays. Goldmoney.com, research, insights. We've been speaking with Alistair McLeod. He is the head of research at goldmoney.com. Alistair, as always, thank you for giving us your perspective and the European perspective on global finance. It's a chilling message that you brought today, but uh, I'm one sorry we need about to hear. that. <laughs> no, it's, it's, <laughs> we yeah. need we need to be aware. Part of our, our tagline is helping you be aware and prepared. So thank you for joining us again this time on Reluctant Preppers. That's very much my pleasure, Dunning. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.